Thank you. Um, uh, my name uh, is David Daintree, and I've been asked to introduce the next segment of the of the conference. Um, and it's my great pleasure to introduce two speakers whom I regard as not only very good friends, but as heroes. Um, uh, I'll, I'll introduce them separately, but just by way of preamble. I'm, uh, I, I admire them uh, because of their indefatigable energy, both of them. They're in the forefront of debate in this important area of, of the uh, children and the family in Australia. Um, I admire them because uh, when I'm about to go to bed at 8 o'clock with my cup of cocoa and, and uh, after a one evening of watching soaps, they're probably still, their day is just half over, they're probably writing speeches or themselves presenting papers at uh, important uh, conferences and events. Um, the first of these is Sophie York. Um, Sophie uh, is married to Paul Duncan, also here today, has four sons, is a naval legal officer, lectures in jurisprudence, is a speaker and writer of great prominence, of, uh, very much a public figure. She's on the board of Campion College. She's a barrister. Um, she tells me she doesn't know how to make a good coffee, but I suppose that's... In <laughs> Uh, um, and uh, she uh, was the national spokesperson for the Marriage Alliance uh, during which, uh, which during the, their campaign, of course, she came into very public prominence. She's also the senior, the lead candidate for the Australian Conservatives in the forthcoming election, next election to the Senate. And uh, she's also a dame of the Equestrian Order of the Holy Sepulchre of Jerusalem. And of course, as everybody knows, there's just nothing, absolutely Thanks. nothing like a day. <laughs> so, we'll introduce uh, Sophie York now, please, to do the first section of our talk, and then we'll introduce uh, the other speaker after that. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, it is such an honour to be with you. And I thank my very dear friend and fellow Campion board member, Carl Schmuder, for inviting me and giving me this opportunity. Um, I'm also delighted to be here as a guest of Paul Morrissey. Um, he's, um, I, I really believe he's doing a wonderful job at this college and he's brought this ethos of diligence and warmth and he's definitely kept the, the tone that David Daintree set when he was president here. So it's very wonderful to be here. Ladies and gentlemen, for me, talking about family is like trying to explain the importance of, say, oxygen, or the importance of love, or the importance of life. And that is what family is. It is the oxygen of life. It is both the yield of life and the haven for love. The yield of love and the haven for love. I'm going to confess up front that um, one of the joys of being married to a fellow movie buff is that you plough your way through many joyous films together and these works of dramatic art give you food for thought. Robin Williams in the movie Mrs Doubtfire plays a man who is driven to dressing up as a housekeeper to see his own children. It is an almost painfully funny but brilliant movie. He says to his wife, played by Sally Field, you just sat there in that courtroom and let that judge pass that despicable sentence. I was angry, she says. You ripped my heart out, he, he replies. She then says, the only thing I know in my heart is that the children were happier when Mrs Doubtfire was part of their lives. So her children were happier when their father, even dressed up as a woman, was in their lives. I'm not advocating cross-dressing, by the way. <laughs> it, was, it was his desperate measure to be with them. <laughs> to me, the importance of family is self-evident and unassailable. If I may share a personal backdrop, um, it, as it partly informs my perspective. My mother believes in family in a big way. I'm one of 12 children. Um, my father provided for us by serving 43 years in the Navy and we moved often and changed schools and neighbourhoods and friendship circles and the one constant was family. Most mornings he woke me up with, um, wake up my girl, Australia needs you, N no pressure. <laughs> my, my siblings are my dearest friends. 
with all the ups and downs in life, and we've recently weathered a, a very big family tragedy, my, the sudden death of my next door neighbour, my niece, 27 year old victorious one, and it's never been more clear to me the precious worth of family. And my children did participate in the funeral car. As the author of The Little Prince, Antoine Saint Exupery noted, <coughs> it is with the heart that one can see rightly. What is essential is invisible to the eye. So when I look at my husband, for example, my eyes see him, and I, I like what I see. <laughs> he looks good to me. <laughs> but, um, but my heart sees selflessness, fidelity, determination, diligence, and humour. He sets an example to our four sons every day. The most valuable things in life cannot be seen with the naked eye. Friendship, hope, integrity, trust, consideration. These are all qualities which are found and nurtured in the cradle of a loving family. When I was National Spokeswoman for Marriage Alliance for three years in the lead up to the postal survey last year, it became apparent to me that marriage and family could be something that was under threat. Family to me was so obvious a concept that the idea of it being something which could be defined by government or undermined by culture was anathema. Marriage in the history of the world came about as a sensible arrangement for the survival of the human race. The protection, the bond, <coughs> it has been around in every culture since time immemorial. Marriage makes sense biologically, philosophically and theologically. Biologically needs no explanation. There's no child created without a mother and father, and the human body needs the corresponding other half to fulfil this mission. And some right now are seeking scientifically to overturn that. Philosophically, it reflects the natural law-based human right of every male and female to marry each other and procreate. And theologically, a few examples. At the beginning of creation, God made them, male and female, be fruitful and multiply. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate, leave and cleave. And of course, we had the beautiful example of the Holy Family, where Joseph took Mary as his wife and raised Jesus as their son. In fact, there's uh, an amusing Christmas card that I was given, and, and um, it's Got Joseph saying, never mind the how and why, Mary. All that matters is we're in a stable relationship. <laughs> so, <laughs> it's, it's Carl. <laughs> so, so, so this was my touchstone in the marriage campaign, that the foundational concept of marriage and family was rock solid. I could back it with confidence. Recently, th thanks to Carl, I've been reading Brave New Family by G.K. Chesterton. Chesterton was married to Frances Blogg, an accomplished woman in her own right, a poet and dramatist, and they were married in 1901 when Chesterton was 27. Chesterton, as, as you may know, at the time was agnostic, and she brought to him a comprehension of Jesus Christ, something for which he gave her credit for in his writings when he wrote in the Ballad of the White Horse, Therefore I bring these rhymes to you who brought the cross to me. She had a large role in his career and became his amu amanuensis and manager, negotiating his publishing deals and, perhaps most cleverly of all, hiring his typists. <laughs> we would probably not be sitting here right now were it not for the initiative and acumen of his wife. Mm -hmm. Chesterton became a Catholic in 1922 and she followed his lead four years later. He made a number of observations about marriage and family in society, including that given there were few places still to discover in the world, the real exploration was to stay home. Nothing, nothing probably requires more courage, determination and spirit of adventure. <laughs> Everything in the modern world is against the unruly, audacious man who is daring enough to have a wife and family. <laughs> He thought normal men and women very much relied upon each other with all their endeavours. The home was, far from being tame or dull, the only place of liberty, the only place of anarchy, the only spot on earth where a man can alter arrangements suddenly, make an experiment, indulge a whim. Everywhere else he goes, he pretty much accepts the strict rules of the shop, 
inn, club or museum that he happens to enter. He can eat his meals on the floor in his own house if he likes. He also revealed a deep appreciation for his wife and observed that a man who makes a vow makes an appointment with himself at some distant time or place. In modern times, this terror of oneself, of the weakness and mutability of oneself, has perilously increased and is the real basis of the objection to vows of any kind. It is this transfiguring self-discipline. He perceived the denigration of marriage and family as being evident in the encouragement of children to ignore their parents and asked why are then not parents free to disregard the child? And that some social reformers overlooked this difficulty and talked only about an abstraction called education whilst meanwhile eliminating the parental function. The actual effect of this theory, Chesterton writes, is that one harassed person has to look after 100 children instead of the one normal person looking after a normal number of them. If you cut off that force of parental input and substitute a paid bureaucracy, you are like a fool who should pay men to turn the wheel of his mill because he refused to use wind or water which he could get for nothing. One can only imagine what he might have thought of the current federal opposition's, uh, opposition leader's $1.7 billion proposal to have Australian three-year-old toddlers educated by the state in their tender formative years rather than be raised by their parents. Chesterton thought that whatever solution was to be found for the women and career issue, it was not to be on the basis of the paltry and small-minded basis that there was anything noble in professional work and anything degrading in domestic work. He felt strongly that those who sought to reform the social institution of marriage should actually understand the historical institution that they were seeking to destroy. Unless they could explain its worth, they should not be permitted to touch it. If I may leave Chesterton for a moment, the concept of family has engaged the minds of many leaders in Australia. Um, former Prime Minister John Howard regarded a stable, happy family as the greatest asset and advantage that anybody could have in life and the best welfare support system yet devised. In his time, he voted against the mere one-year-only separation requirement um, in the Family Law Act of 1975 to, to ground a divorce, knowing that the terrible message that it's sent to society as to the quality and permanence of marriage, but the vote was lost. So anti-marriage, anti-family ideology won, and the figures thereafter spoke for themselves. His predecessor Menzies observed, the home is the foundation of sanity and sobriety. It is the indispensable condition of continuity. Its health determines the health of society as a whole. Pope John Paul II said in a homily in Australia in 1986, I saw him at the race course mass, as the family goes, so goes the nation, and so goes the whole world in which we live. His Holiness made the point that in a world that is becoming ever more sensitive to women's rights, what is to be said of the rights of women who want to be, or, or need to be, full-time wives and mothers? Are they to be burdened by a taxation system that discriminates against women who choose not to leave the home in order to earn a separate income? Without infringing the freedom of anyone to seek fulfilment in employment and activities outside the home, should not the work of the homemaker be properly appreciated and adequately supported? My own view is that children in a good family learn about the realities of love. They learn about little babies and noise and fun. They learn about deep friendship and how to resolve disagreements and how to own and look after your own things, but also how to share. They learn about how husbands and wives treat each other. Um, this observation will influence them for, for life. In my, in my view, couples can have confidence that, can, that they can be good parents. They have the strongest natural instincts for nurture. The exceptions, of course, proving the rule. Of, on all the evidence that I read, the best thing for a child, including social, emotional, life aspirations, positive outcomes, is to have a married mother and father 
in a stable, low-conflict marriage. This is not to say that people in different settings are not doing their best. Most are. People are juggling all sorts of arrangements and making all sorts of sacrifices, whatever their life situation is. A few statistics. Um, in Australia in 1970, there were 9.3 marriages per thousand Australian residents per year. This is called a marriage rate of 9.3. In 2016, the marriage rate had declined to 4.9. So 9.3 to 4.9. So almost half the rate of 1970. <laughs> so this tells you what Australians think about marriage. Whether it's worth venturing into as a worthwhile institution or whether it's risky that they take it seriously perhaps and, and don't want it to fail so they don't get married. There's undoubtedly multifactorial reasons. The divorce rate the divorce rate rose in the 1960s and 1970s and it peaked at 4.6 per thousand residents per annum after the introduction of the Family Law Act 1975. And that allowed, as you know, <coughs> no-fault no divorce. The good news is that the divorce rate has recently fallen. So in 2016 it was 1.9 and that's the lowest rate since 1976. So yes, marrying less but divorcing less. If there's a mathematician amongst you, they can tell me what the proportions are there. <laughs> Bettina Arndt found in her sex survey of 2014, of 20,000 people across Australia, that 96% of respondents said they expected sexual exclusivity of themselves and their partner, which is, which is higher than, than this figure was a decade ago. So the expectation of fidelity is growing. <coughs> We have 25 million people with 8.8 .8 million households. 3.6 million of them have children in them. And not such good news is that 919,000, 919,000, are single parent households. So that's about a quarter, a bit more than a quarter. Don't do maths. I'm looking at my husband. He's very mathematical. So yes, and there's a maths teacher in the room. So yes, divorce rates have finally dropped slightly, but the overall picture is sad if you recall the earlier evidence about what is best for children. What I learnt during those years working in Marriage Alliance is that our opponents are hell-bent on destroying the traditional concept of family. They do not believe in it. They fail to see its benefits. The legalisation of same-sex marriage was going to be the vehicle via which they achieved a shrinking of freedoms, religious, speech, and parental, parental rights. The driving philosophy for them is cultural Marxism. It's evident in schools, universities, societal, with the notable exception of Campion and Notre Dame, societal institutions and professional bodies, corporations, and the governing discourse. Just to give you a brief rundown on Marx, he himself was baptised and married in a Lutheran church, but he did not remain Christian. He and his wife, who was a Prussian baroness, had seven children together. He's believed to have had a child with his housekeeper also. Only three of his seven children survived to adulthood as they lived in extreme poverty because Marx did not do much paid work himself. He mostly involved himself in writing and revolutionary activities. He had poor health which was not helped by his alcohol and tobacco habits, poor diet and failure to sleep. He seemed to blame his own lack of ability to provide adequately for his family, or remain faithful, upon the entire capitalist system, which rewarded risk and hard work. He was famous for his conflict theory of society, which divided it into oppressor and exploited classes. Marx and Friedrich Engels collaborated on the Communist Manifesto in 1848, which called for the forcible overthrow of all existing social conditions and Das Kapital in 1967. So rather than simply agitating for better working conditions, they thought it was better to throw the baby out with the bathwater and, and upend everything, economy, government, family, society, and, and to an extent religion, despite Marx believing that it was the people's comfort, the opium of the masses, the sigh of the oppressed creature. With Marx's notes, Engels penned the book The Origin of the Family, Private Property and the State in 1884. 
They suggested that the nucleus of private property and inequality lies in the family, they, they, where wife and children are essentially the slaves of the husband. The, the whole construct was a prop for capitalism, and the idea that gender is a social construct had its genesis here, along with gender-neutral language, gender-neutral toilets, sports, and so forth. Marketers and linguistic scholars know the worth and power of words. Wittgenstein wrote about it. So did Orwell. He who controls language controls people. In his essay, in Orwell's essay, Politics and the English Language, he noted that the decay of language was connected to the decay of thought and the collapse of a culture. He was very concerned about the ruthlessness that collectivist regimes showed towards any dissent. The word marriage is a word which has a particular meaning, husband and wife. It has positive cachet, built up over thousands of years. They should have found another word. It's quite artificial what has happened here. Politicians have legislated to redefine a long-standing special word. In schools, the Safe Schools program was the biggest giveaway. In other countries, they waited until same-sex marriage was legalised. In Australia, they thought they'd roll it out first. They never expected the outcry. Parents were so horrified by the content that it was cancelled in New South Wales, but it is still going right now in Victoria. The content includes teaching children about chest binding and penis tucking, that, that gender is fluid, that any tomboyish inclinations by teenage girls or effeminate tendencies by a boy were actually that they were in the wrong body and should consider transitioning with puberty blockers and later sex change surgery. Can't get a tattoo, but chop off your nets. Sorry. <laughs> One mother told us her son was advised he could wear a dress to school. Another said they were shown sex, the children were shown sex toys and told not to tell their parents. The dangers this teaching has exposed children to and the promotion of gender dysphoria will be something that will unfold for decades, I suspect. My, my late sister, Noelle York, would call it millstone material. This separation of one's identity from one's biological sex and your worth being connected to your identity is identity politics. And the goal of it is to try to belong somehow to an oppressed group based on race, colour, gender, and so on. The author of Safe Schools, Ros Ward, said, if parents compla complained, tell them, tough luck. As the LGBTIQ activists stripped gender from marriage, it's now any two people, they are also stripping it from all other aspects in civil life. Language, birth certificates, school education, restrooms, hospital wards, prisons, sport. And it is creating havoc overseas from rapes in women's prisons to female sportswomen having to compete with men who either have surgery or simply identify as women. And who, like transgender martial arts um, Fallon Fox, gave Tamika Brents a, a, a broken eye socket <coughs> and concussion. So a biological male smashed the head of a woman and she'd never felt force like that in her life, in all her competing. This week we saw a biological male win the International Masters Track Cycling World Championships, a women's event. The XY chromosome transgender Rachel McKinnon beat two biological women. A lifetime of testosterone in the muscles will do that for you. <laughs> the word mother, the word mother, just let that settle on you for a moment. Arguably the most evocative word in the world is being removed from birth certificates. Already in Australia, Mother's Day and Father's Day at some schools is being substituted for Special Persons Day. <laughs> We've seen ADFA, where they train our future military leaders, issuing guidelines to cadets about what pronouns they should use. The Diversity Council of Australia issued guidelines to corporations on acceptable language, including such gems as using they, the plural, even when it's singular, he, she, or new pronouns, she and je. Our national airline Qantas advised employees they were not to use words like mother and father 
or darling or love. I don't know how they're going to get their stewards to comply with that one, but anyway. <laughs> Re-universities. Straight white males are more and more regarded in the universities as oppressors. Bella de Brera of IPA analysed 700 plus history courses and found an overrepresentation of gender and oppression studies in history, history courses. Not, not factual analysis or interpretation. La Trobe University tried to ban Bettina Arndt recently from talking and providing accurate data about the fake rape crisis to students. This week, IPA revealed that allegations of sexual assault are planned to be dealt with by universities, so this is Sydney and Tasmania, doing their own investigations and applying a lower standard of proof to the allegations. On balance of probabilities <coughs> instead of the beyond reasonable doubt of civil authorities. This is all ideological overreach of the highest order. And, and getting back briefly to Chesterton, he wrote, When all are sexless, there will be equality. There will be no women and no men. There will be but a fraternity, free and equal. The only consoling thing is that it will endure only for one generation. <laughs> we, we saw the tactics play out in the last fortnight in the leaked results of the Religious Freedom Review. Marriage Alliance made a submission, and I've read a number of them. People mostly in their submissions simply wanted to be able to teach, preach, practice their faith, employ, and raise their children in accordance with their own faith. It is monstrous that the major parties threw gay kids onto a political bonfire as though that's what religious freedom is all about. All these nasty Christian schools wanting to expel gay kids, they don't. I'm not aware of any of them even asking for that. It was a ploy designed to get the public offside against believers. It's the inherent right of any parent to have their children educated according to their faith and according to their own moral convictions. And Australia ratified the International Covenant of, uh, on Civil and Political Rights, the ICCPR, which affirms this right at 18.4. This new political movement allows no space for anyone else. And yet John Milbank, in his Ontology of Peace, points out correctly that peace is achieved not by domination of one over the other, but by allowing space for each other, by living alongside each other. The issues affecting children and family in Australia are not limited to religion. Our language and our traditions are being trashed. My friend Warren Mundine shared his view on family from an Indigenous perspective. He felt that it had become unfashionable in progressive circles to talk about the importance of family. He said, a good family is where parents do their job, ensuring children are fed and have good hygiene, taking them to a doctor or hospital when they're sick, ensuring they have clothing and shelter and go to bed, sending them to school every day and keeping them safe, which means knowing where they are and who they're with and ensuring they're safe in the home the family, he said, is the core of safe and sustainable communities. Get families back on track and communities will follow. Horrid examples of moves overseas to usurp the parental role include things recently as bizarre as in the UK, six-year-olds being compelled to write a love letter to a man. Or in Scotland, the outrageous named person idea where a bureaucrat is appointed for every child in the nation. Our opponents know that the hand that rocks the cradle is the hand that rules the world, William Ross Wallace, an American poet of Scottish ancestry, as it happens, and he put it so well, so well. And so they, they know that, and they deliberately want to intervene in that process and take control. That's why we must never give in to them. Never. I began with Mrs Doubtfire, so um, I might finish with it. Mr Hillard, played by Robin Williams, gives his closing address to the family court judge. Your Honour, in regards to my behaviour, I can only plead insanity. Because ever since my children were born, the moment I looked at them, I was crazy about them. Once I held them, I was hooked. I'm addicted to my children, sir. I love them with all my heart. And the idea of someone telling me I can't be with them, I can't see them every day, it's like someone saying, I can't have air. I can't live without air and I can't live without them. Listen, I would do anything. I just 
want to be with them. I know I need that, sir. Thank you.